bum, 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 bum. It is the island, the island of Sodor. Sir Topham Hatt owns it all. He is real greedy. And, the, and, and kind of sleazy. Yeah. I, as it was always kind of awkward because even as a kid, I was like, you know, this is exploitative. Yeah. You know, like all they care about is being very useful engines. Yeah. You're a very useful engine. I was like, don't these trains want to have lives of their own? But they can't because they're, they're confined to tracks. Yeah. They can never go off the tracks. So they have to go where the people who built the tracks tell them to go. Well, there was a funny satire I saw once that said it's a chug life. You know, choo choo chug chug chug. Chug life, yeah. yeah. It was, uh... You and I saw an interesting video <laughs> where somebody took George Carlin samples of him reading from his audiobooks yeah. and intermixed them with him narrating stories from Thomas the Tank Engine <laughs> to make it sound like he said all kinds of whacked out stuff, you the know. Kids. Yeah. <laughs> See, you and I are, as we get older, we're kind of close. You know, as, as people get older, they become closer to being the same age. Yeah. Because there is an age difference between you and, and I, yeah. not, like about six years. Yeah. But as we get older, that age difference is, becomes kind of less and less important, you know. But uh, I do still notice it because, you know, you probably never saw Shining Time Station. Oh, I did. Oh, you did? Yeah, everybody liked it. I watched the reruns and all that. That was probably my favorite thing, because I knew the conductor, George Carlin, and, you know. And, you know, the, the conductor before that was Ringo Starr. Yeah, for, like, one season. And they even had George Carlin redo that for him, because they didn't like Ringo. <laughs> did they really? Yeah. I didn't even know that. Yeah. I thought Ringo did an okay job. I like Ringo. Ringo's yeah. the only Beatle I like at all. Huh. Like, he's the one, like, he because he was a cool guy, and he wasn't full of himself. And he, he tried to answer every bit of fan mail he ever got. Because he didn't get much. No, he got a lot. Huh. In fact, he got the most. Huh. He got the most of anyone. Yeah. Uh, and he tried to answer answer it all. Uh, but then about 20 years ago, he kind of he decided, I, like, I'm sorry, fellas, I'm going to have to give up. I'm not even making a dent in all my fan mail. So <laughs> I'm sorry. But they even, on The Simpsons, they even, like, uh, he, he guest starred and one of the plot points was that he was trying to answer all of his fan mail, and he finally got around to answering Marge's uh, yeah. fan letter. But anyway, George Carlin said that he's the anti-Pete Best because Ringo replaced Pete Best in the Beatles. George Carlin oh. replaced Ringo, so he's the anti-Pete yeah. He's the anti -Pete Best. Huh. And Carlin said that the Shining Time Station thing was one of the things he was most proud of in his career, yeah. being Mr. Conductor. So, um, but then after Shining Time Station ended, Thomas the Tank Engine just kind of became its own show. Yeah. And a whole generation of kids who, like, were born in the 90s kind of grew up not even knowing that it was part of Shining Time Station, they, thinking that it was just Thomas the Tank Engine and that's all there was to it, you know. Yeah. But I think now it's like CG. Yeah, they don't, and they don't even have die cast. They don't even make them die cast. I don't know what they are. These, these are Ertl Toys die-cast ones. They originated in 1985. And what we're doing is a special here with the uh, 1998 Metallic Thomas. Because I, I got a whole crew of Thomases. He, get, he got his own stunt performers and backup guys. You know, yeah. Because he's the big star. And that's what you do. It's kind of like The Matrix. Oh. It's like when Agent Smith co kept copying himself. Yeah. You know, they're all like... like um, to, uh, they're all ganging up on Sir Topham Hatton and overthrowing him a, a, yeah. as a dictator. Yeah. Like you got this shiny, the shiny Thomas uh -huh. back here. He's the boss. He's like the he's like the main. He's like the proto Thomas. Yeah. He's like the the king. The, he's the father of all the Thomases, <laughs> and he's coming up behind Sir Topham Hatton to to knock him over. Yeah. Topple the fat cat with the top hat off his throne. Yeah. You know how Thomas the Tank Engine started? Yeah, during World War II. It was a British guy basically just coming up with um, stories to tell his kids. Yeah. And ended up writing them down, publishing them, and they were really popular. Yeah. And a lot of children's authors 
uh, took off that way. Huh. Like, it, it all started with them just coming up with stories to entertain their kids. And then that, uh, that ended up uh, becoming lucrative. So. Yeah. so it's pretty common. So spend time with your kids and then get the moral of the story. Spend time with your kids and try to come up with creative shit to tell them to make them go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, uh, it's like Samuel L. Jackson with his book, Go the Fuck to Sleep. Oh, he wrote that one? Yeah. Huh. I think he did. Okay. Go the fuck to sleep. My mom came up with a uh, uh, a bunch of stories, and I keep telling her to write them down. Yeah. She says she's like, "Oh, I'll write them down someday," you know. But someday never comes. Yeah, I think that she doesn't really remember all the details of a lot of them. Yeah. But she did come up with a lot of like it was a series called The Enchanted Forest huh. that she came up with, and I. And I really would like her to start to start writing those down, but yeah, a lot of parents did that. And uh, cool. Yep, spend time with your kids. And so one of the reasons that I'm doing this here is I like doing a collaboration with you. Usually we'll do one uh, once a week or every time we hang out. I'll do some on your channel. You'll do some on mine. And to me, this is kind of a reflection and inflection point, and whatever you want to call it, because I. This is like my second legitimate attempt at trying to do a channel. Yeah. And you were a big driving force on renaming it to Dicastinator. And that has your blessing, right? I kissed your ring and of YouTube greatness and you're like, yes, this this channel shall be good. Right, Captain? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Captain, well, my captain. Oh, Captain, my captain. Well, I, I came up with a bunch of potential names. Yeah. And... The first one I actually texted was Diecastinator, and yeah. that one, that one made the cut. And uh, it's it's weird. It's weird to actually go on YouTube and see something, and know that you had an influence on it. It's yeah. it's it's interesting. It, and for you to know that, and like nobody else who looks at your channel is ever going to know that. But unless I, they watch this video, yeah, unless they watch this <laughs> specific video, yeah. But it's it's kind of cool to know that you had that kind of an influence on someone. But um, were these trains all made in the same year, same no, same they, time? Or? They, they originated, the design was in 1985. And then um, the one there that you're holding, the Metallic Thomas, was a 1998 special edition one. Okay, and then what about the other two? They're, they're both 85. But that's when they were designed. I don't know when they were actually manufactured. They produced them, I think, until like <clears throat> when the series ended. Whatever. I found it, one, you know... It's it's cool how the show had these, you know, a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of guys are into like train sets, yeah, and you know, like all these guys in their basements, these like basement engineers, they have like detailed train sets with yeah. like hills and mm -hmm. stations yeah. and and all that stuff. Uh, there was a McDonald's I used to go to a lot that had a train station right there in the in the dining area. Um, this show took a tr took like a train um, a model train yeah. setup and turned it into a show. Yeah. All these models and everything, <clears throat> everything you see, it's not stop motion; it's models. You know, because the this, they didn't actually like do stop motion animation. How did they move their eyes? Was it that stop motion probably? Or? Well, they moved their their eyes in between takes. Oh. Because you see, like, you never see their eyes actually change in the shot. Okay. Like, they'll always go off, take to another shot, and then back to that character in their oh. eyes. I They had, like, a bunch of different faces that they would put on. Okay. To the to the train. Because, like, every train, like, like all those circles on the yeah. front with the face. Um, oh. Which they did a similar thing in... Um, the Nightmare Before Christmas. Like, uh, I watched a video once where the, the main character in The Nightmare Before Christmas and all the other characters, every different expression was a different head. Damn. Yeah, so they had like hundreds or even thousands of different heads for that character with all slightly different facial expressions. Yeah. Now, it wasn't quite that detailed in Thomas the Tank Engine, but they had like a happy face for all of them. A uh, confused face, an angry face, yeah, you know, and like uh, an upset face, and they would just snap those onto the front. Huh. I don't know. To 
me, the, the aesthetic of that show was just really cool because you didn't really see that in any other show. Because like you were saying, with the real authentic die cast set yeah. for uh, the model train versus the CGI stuff. CGI, anybody would be drunk with like a, you know, Photoshop to try and throw something together. Well, and imagine how much, how much scenery they had to build. Yeah. Because you see a lot of different scenery in that show. Yeah. You can, and you can tell that it's not reused. I mean, some of it is, but some of it isn't. Like, a lot of it isn't. It's just like a one-off thing that they created this ornate whatever. For. It's like one shot I remember seeing in that, in that compilation we watched of uh, their, their, like, tracks along the side of a cliff. Mm. And it's like, holy crap. I mean, like, that, that's got to be a giant studio where they shoot all of that. Yeah. To have all of that, all of that scenery and everything, you know. I mean, it's it's a lot. It's a lot of stuff. It's more than any one guy would have in his basement. I mean, <laughs> but this uh, this show probably got a lot of kids into trains. Yeah. And a lot of people, a lot of got a lot of kids into like uh, models and like you said, diecast stuff. Yeah. And um, it's uh, oh, what else was I going to say? Um, well, to me, it's a lot more stimulating than uh, CGI. And the other thing that you got me thinking about with training is uh, Trolley from uh, Mr. Rogers. Oh, yeah. Well, and that was another PBS thing. Yeah. Because, yeah, Shining Time Station was PBS. And, yeah. uh, trolleys were cool. Yeah. Um, and there used to be a lot of them. Uh, they would even go between towns. In fact, there's even like a, a certain town that you and I know of, mm -hmm. a certain city made of stone. <laughs> that had a trolley. That little town had a trolley. That's what, uh, yeah, that somebody told me. Well, yeah. I believe it because trains are a lot more utilized today. Yeah. Trains are a lot more efficient, but they're just culturally frowned upon in America. You know, we're like, we just have consolidated monopolies of profiteering and, and long term tr uh, train stuff, you know. Yeah. If it's going to be a short distance, we're going to use trucks, but. Trucks do something like 90% of the damage, but they only pay for 35% of the wear and tear on highways. Yeah. Yeah. So. I'm, I'm a big fan of the rails to trails movement. And uh, we're seeing a lot of that in this town because this was a big railroad hub in yeah. its time. And uh, there's a certain trail that's, uh, they actually replaced a couple of railroad bridges not far from where I live. And turned them into pedestrian bridges, yeah. which is something that I've been wanting, I've been hoping that they would do for a long time. So I'm really happy about that, and I plan to make use of those uh, this next spring and summer. Uh, that's that's going to be a lot of fun. But I remember what I was going to say. Um, my dad was really into trains, okay. and he got a kick out of the fact in this show out of the fact that the diesels in this show are almost always the bad guys. Yeah. The steam engines are the good guys. The diesels are the bad guys. Because the diesels were more modern. Yeah. They were newer. They were always kind of threatening to replace the steam engines. But they're a lot more efficient because they're, they're diesel electric and they can kick ass. Yes, but they're not as aesthetically pleasing. Oh, okay. There we go. Yeah, see, so, and I think a lot of people lost uh, interest in trains when diesels came out. Yeah. Yeah, you're right, because... The other ones were really these ornate, fancy, cool engines. Where then the diesels, they, just, you look at them, they all, I don't want to say they all look the same, but you know what I mean? Yeah, they're just like box shaped and they're, uh, yeah. um, I had a chance a couple of years ago to get to, to, to uh, see a, an old steam engine. And that's actually uh, available on my channel. You know, you should comment on this one and put a link to it. I will. I'll put a link to it on my channel. But they parked it next to a factory here in town uh, for a bunch of people to check out. And a lot of people came out to see that thing. Yeah, I drove by it. I was driving from another place and I remember I just saw how packed it was. And, um, and yeah, uh, so those old, these old steam engines and steam locomotives, they harkened back to people, to, to, to other eras. Like, from about like the 1950s to the 1800s, the old West, you yeah. know, like the wild West and the, and the, that whole era, you know, and the, the civil war. And back when this, 
this type of train was in use. And um, steam technology uh, was a big thing in the 1800s and into the early 1900s. Yeah. And some of the earliest cars were steam powered. In fact, the first car, the first thing you could call a car mm -hmm. was actually invented or was actually built in like the early 1800s. Huh. So when people say that the car was invented in like 1885 or whatever, yeah. really the first, what you would call a car was, was built more like the early 1800s, huh. but, but it was steam powered. Yeah, um, it was a horseless carriage. Yeah, it was a horseless carriage that was steam powered. So that was really kind of the first car. And steam power, uh, even the ancient Romans knew about steam power. power. They oh. knew that it was theoretically possible. Yeah. They just never bothered to build anything steam powered because they had slaves. Oh, yeah. But, you know, like steam power, it's a powerful technology that, uh, that has existed for a long time. And it could have continued to exist for a long time. That's kind of what's behind steampunk is like yeah. basically extrapolating and thinking, you know, like, if if this type of technology had continued to be the preferred uh, type of locomotion, but it be but it but it advanced, what would it look like? Say a hundred years later, you know what what would advanced steam technology look like? And that's where you get like robots that are steam powered and things so like that. So it's kind of like analog technology in, in that sense with a futuristic spin. Because there's a whole society that I know of that are all steampunk guys. Yeah. Right? I just never made it out there and just, yeah. Steampunk is cool, but I'm in some ways, like aesthetically, I'm actually more into. Oops, I'm actually more into diesel punk. This is a watch that I uh, that I bought recently that I'm actually going to make a video about pretty soon. So stay tuned for that. But it's a diesel brand watch, mm -hmm. and it has kind of a diesel punk look to it. Like diesel punk is basically the same thing. It's the same concept of st as steampunk. But it's technology that went from about, say, World War One era to the early or until like the nineteen forties. So basically, huh. between World War One and World War Two, yeah. and that's that's diesel punk because diesel became the preferred uh, 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 locomotion technology after steam. Interesting. When diesel was refined and uh, well, is it steam basically coal? Yeah, it's basically where you you take coal or something else and you heat water, you mm -hmm. superheat water, uh, so that it turns a so that it so that it, it, it the energy from the hot water turns turns the the gears and the the stuff in the engine and makes the engine go, yeah. like turns the pistons and whatnot. Yeah. So that's it's really almost it's 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 superheated water. Um, and you can use coal. Usually, it was coal because that was the most uh, energy-rich, uh, yeah. you know, the most energy-rich uh, uh, thing they they could burn. Uh, some were wood. Some some steam-powered things you'd burn wood, but it it just wasn't as energy-rich as coal. Yeah. Coal was a lot because of all the carbon in coal. It was a lot a lot more energy in in coal. Um, some people in the 1800s actually tried to. Uh, try to uh, utilize gunpowder. Huh. Well, that doesn't make, sound like it end well. It didn't, yeah. Make, <laughs> make a gunpowder-powered engine, which would have been amazing if it could have worked, but they could never stabilize it. Yeah, it'd be like a suicide bomb. Yeah, yeah. So so that's interesting. Like, we off, end up going on the ta tangents about different uh, technologies in the in the ancient world and in the, in the uh, Industrial Revolution and and into the into the 1900s so well that's what's nice here it's like i do two minute videos these days and we can do like a 20 minute one and just add different perspectives and context to some of these key things and i had a birthday party that was kind of themed yep this is a napkin from that actual party yeah well, so so you it shows how how personal the connection the thomas is in your life when i had a relative in my family when they were a really young kid they would always say i love percy but it's you know, <laughs> percy the train but the way they said it it sounded like it was something else did you pick up on that i love percy yeah yeah so 
I liked Edward. I did too, because he's chill too. He's number 10. Yeah, Edward was like the older one. Yeah. He was the one that was that, like, they all made fun of him for being old, but he was, he looked, he looked a lot like Thomas because he was blue. Yeah. Um, and he was, yeah, he was kind of the, the one that, uh, the elder train. Well, Gordon was the old part, but he was always stuck up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I remember them saying that, like, Edward was older. Yeah. And, uh. Trevor the Tractor and Carol and the Helicopter. Was Jasper the red one, or what was his name? James. James. James was the red one. Yeah. James was, like, the hot-headed one. Yeah. He was, like, angry and and hot tempered and yeah. but then they started like you know they had like helicopters and uh, trucks and trucks and SUVs and there are no SUVs <laughs> <laughs> submarines and yeah. and uh, the Canyon Arrow they put that on that was their SUV yeah which the top of the rolled off in a Canyon Arrow yeah. instead of the 1937 Ford Bonnet I think the Tesla rocket made an appearance in that. Yeah, <laughs> I think that. I, in one of my videos, I just went on a whole tangent of what I thought about Tesla. So, but, uh, yeah. I think it's interesting. It's cool, yeah, to have the three gang of Thomas. I felt like this would be an interesting thumb arc. It's, you know what he's like, what he's doing now? What? He's going, fly, my pretties, fly! <laughs> like a pack of trains that he's going to sick on somebody. Yeah. This video was brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's interesting? I know that's a video game, but that's about all I know about it. Yeah, that's all I know too. All it's it's a game where you fight people. Okay. Like you you come up you you, you make a character and you battle. Okay. It's like a fighting game. Which... <laughs> Brought to you by Raid Shadow. And Jeff Goldblum endorses it. Oh, it's cool, dude. Yeah. It's not like he does anything for money, though. Like, when you're doing apartments.com and all that. Oh, stuff yeah. Whatever, it's, he totally does that for free. Yeah. yeah. He just does that because he wants everybody to have a nice apartment. I'm sure he just lived in a small, efficient studio and was very humble in that. Yeah. So, but, um, um. Yeah, I, I'm not into fighting games. No, I don't either. Well, outside of Grand Theft Auto, that's probably the only one I'm into. But that one, you can just drive around in a car, listen to the radio. Yeah, that's almost more about just driving. Like, yeah. like you do beat people up, but it's like it's secondary. The main thing is just like get into a car and <laughs> drive around for a while, and then get into a, trash it and get into another car. Yeah, it's just like a free roaming type thing. They should make a Grand Theft Auto version of Thomas the Tank Engine. That would be really dramatic though, it's a little kid. Yeah. They do like train routes. Why not make it like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid where yeah. you got the steam and then they just you know You'd have to be able to like you'd have to make sure that you pull the lever at just the right time, those 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 rail switching levers. Yeah. You remember how like um a lot of people that probably don't even remember how that's done, but like you, you pull the lever so that the so the the, the, the rail switches from going one way to going another way. Yeah. So, because that's the only way that you could control where you go, because otherwise it'd be the most boring driving game ever, because you're just on a track, you know. But you'd have to be able to pull the switch at just the right time, or have have the person, the engineer, turn the switch at just the right time. There's actually a number of train simulator games. Okay. Too, and I played one growing up, and it was cool. And there's a free and open source one that's not corporate controlled. I'm drawing a blank on what they're called, but yeah, there's like the railroaders and all these things, and it's yeah. like Sim City for trains. But I just remembered it was really frustrating. And my railroad kept going bankrupt. Yeah. But you know, in U.S. law, railroads can't go bankrupt. There's protections in place for it, and the workers on railroads get their own pension. They don't pay any social security. So yeah, it's pretty trippy setup. Well, they you know, they had to they had to like. Uh, bury a lot of bodies to get those railroads built. Yeah. They had to like basically like uh you know a lot lot of lot of foreign workers were killed, yeah. blown up, you know, blowing up tunnels and and then a lot of people were forced off their land. Eminent domain. Yeah. There's a lot <laughs> of eminent domain going on. Yeah. And uh 
to me, the railroad is a very Midwestern thing. Like when I think of the railroad, there's a very, it has a very strong tie to the Midwest. And uh, my, my, my own, my home is very kind of like railroad themed. I have a lot of artifacts from the railroad. I have like railroad ties. Yeah. And I have actually have a piece of rail uh, that, that looks like an anvil. I use that as a paperweight. I have uh, three panels that have uh, artwork images of the railroad. Yeah. Um, a lot of just a lot of kind of rustic artifacts of like you know midwestern. You know, you should do a visual just of your rail artifacts. Oh, and ins the insulators. I, yeah. I I actually have a series of the railroad insulators that I have. Okay. I have those up in my living room window, so the the sun shines through them. They're very pretty, but I have a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, there's that. There's any. There's a lot of kind of agricultural artifacts. A lot of stuff ha uh, relating to like the Mississippi River. You know, like steamboats and things yeah. like that. I feel like all of that stuff is very midwestern. Yeah. It's very kind of like Mississippi Valley uh, type stuff, and so that's. I like to kind of surround my stuff with myself with that kind of s stuff that's like historic and. Uh, and uh, because I, I grew up very close to a railroad, an exempt railroad, and uh, it was a railroad that was actually active when my dad was a kid, and he was very. Why did you call it an exempt railroad? Because it it w wasn't wasn't an active railroad. Oh, it's exempt, is what they call it. Then? Yeah, exempt. Yeah, huh. okay. and it had been exempt for forty something years, oh, wow. so the trees had grown up. Uh, you know, and like the, the the rails had been had been removed and everything. And there was almost no sign of there ever having been a railroad there, except for just the fact that it's like this line of trees and some raised ground, and that's all you have these days, pretty much, except for just a few key railroads here and there that still stop traffic here in see in in the town that we live in. But you know, what's interesting. There's something I had read that said. The trains were, the railroads are taxed based on the amount of mileage they have and the amount of tracks they have. So there was a big incentive for the railroads to cut it back. That's why they shut down so much. Of them. Yeah. And they could have utilized it, but it was just tax policy disincentivized them to do that. Um, the other thing I was thinking about decorations is my, my decorations are like the polar opposite of yours. Like I have an anchor in the back. Behind yeah, me. yeah, you're very nautical. Yeah, I'm very... like all this tropical stuff. <laughs> I have really localized uh, nice stuff, and it's like, yeah, I got it. Well, and also, like, I have, like, Grant Wood art everywhere. Yeah. You know, yeah. like... Warhol. All of this... Cut. Yeah, you have Warhol. It's, <laughs> it's like, like the, the opposite. The very opposite, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, no, I mean, I like your nautical... I think the nautical stuff suits you. Yeah. The, the boats and the ships and everything, and the harbors and all of that. Yeah. So. But, um, yeah, I, I'm going to probably do more Thomas... The tank, and I think this was cool. I did a quickie with them uh, when I was shooting a whole bunch of these comments and a whole bunch of my diecast ones. And I want to do um, one video a day. I've been working up on getting that backlog taken care of. Yeah. I'll probably have 130, 140 of them within the next week. So then that way I'll have so much life enriching content. Any of you guys that love diecast can, uh, can watch it. And, and it's, it's curious. Because I, I tried to. I always liked YouTube and stuff. I watched a ton of it. I never felt that I could be among the stars and, and have my, uh, you know, have a channel or have something worthwhile to say on it. And I tried initially doing a financial channel, and that was just a joke. Because <laughs> I'm like, buy a duplex, invest in diversified index funds, stay away from degenerate financial scumbags, yeah, and uh, don't piss your money away. It's like, how am I going to make a channel of that? You know, so then I just was like, nah. And I tried all kinds of different content there, but most of it flopped. I mean, the, the only stuff that I got views on was like my Disney hand sanitizer, which I have up, different satire ones. Yeah. Ones where I was picking a fight with other YouTubers. That stuff would go good, but, you know, it wasn't really content I was proud of or really was sane or yeah, this is something you care about. It doesn't feel like it's phoned in. Yeah. Some of the other stuff seemed a little phoned in. I'm like, here's a brochure from 2008 that I got about 
home mortgage crisis stuff. I think I read it a agency here, but I just thought I'd share it with you guys. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but, uh, so yeah, that's, that's good. And I also have a channel. It's called Captain Unusual. I'm closing in on 1,100 subscribers. Wow. I'd love to get to 1,100 before uh, Valentine's Day. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Uh, I, I It's mostly kind of a hobbyist channel. It's kind of, it, it tends to, to focus mostly on hobbies and kind of amateur historical videos. Yeah. But it, I also do a little bit of other stuff too. It's kind of a kind of a little bit of everything, just whatever I'm into. So. For mine, I want it to be 99% diecast and diecast accessories. And then I'm going to do one finance video a month on something that interests me. And then a book review a month. The other one I'm going to be striving for. So that kind of gives you, I'll probably put something on here about a channel update or something like that for this this video and stuff because I think a lot of the YouTubers that I used to watch are just kind of falling off the earth with them because a lot of them I just stopped commenting on and, and I got sick of them. Uh, two shout outs to one to Millennial Mike who's a really cool dude in finance and then uh, a dude named Mark who's Mike's buddy. Those, those guys are good. Now you've got the hiccups. I know. And then Strongman Personal Finance is good. Um, Aaron that being a broke loser. <laughs> and then uh, I don't know I'm trying to think of who else are good finance guys but we could almost do a whole video of us just talking about our favorite YouTubers Yeah. and if we wanted to talk about the YouTubers that suck I don't even really want to say it because then you're just getting them publicity Yeah. but there's a lot of them that I think are just like 90% of them are awful Yeah. they're, just, they're, they're incompetent they're just saying whatever clickbaity BS that they can get to get some views and Forget about them. So. Yeah. Um, so anyway, subscribe to our channels. I uh, put out a video roughly every three days, and I do a pre I have a pretty good rhythm going where, you know, like every uh, every, you know, I like I do a video like this kind of video, and then 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 I kind of repeat the cycle. It's kind of like almost like a cycle system. Cool. So, um, and then. Obviously, you're watching this video on the Dicastinators channel. So, yeah. so yeah, and we're up, we're up to almost 33 minutes now. That's good. I'm probably gonna be running out of space soon. The battery's gonna die, so I think we're at probably a pretty good spot. And uh, it's always fun doing these collaborations with you. Yeah, yeah. This is like 20 videos of what I would do. In this <laughs> one video, but. I always, you know, I don't know how, how we'll phrase it. I like doing it there, but when somebody sees Captain Unusual, they go, ah, oh, those guys can't shut the hell up. They're just going <laughs> to go on these crazy tangents. But that's what makes it fun and makes it different. And I think well, and usually these are videos, these are, uh, we do them about uh, ones that we have a little bit more to say about. Yeah, yeah. That we both have a shared experience or knowledge about. And there's plenty of them. we got a bunch in the works, too, that we're going to do. And, uh, yeah, so... So be a very useful engine and subscribe. <laughs> Have a great day, guys.